everybody. Welcome back to yet another Journal Club from Lifespan.io. I'm Dr. Oliver Medvedic, and um, welcome yet again. So we have another journal article uh, related, of course, as, as usual, to longevity and lifespan. Uh, and this is an interesting one that came out pretty recently. Uh, I think we're all familiar with using um, various sorts of compounds um, that are derived from organisms around the world, um, microbes, plants, right? So the pharmacopoeia of medicine is basically, um, most of it is derived from compounds from, from other organisms. We're aware of antibiotics, for example, that come from microbes, antifungals that come from microbes, anti-cancer agents that come from plants such as taxol. Um, but this paper takes a, kind of a more interesting approach, which is um, deriving small compounds uh, metabolites directly from uh, us humans and using them as uh, as medicinal compounds uh, so it's it's a novel approach um, and I'm gonna pull up this paper here so let's pull up this paper here there we go does that look fairly clear everybody American Journal of Clinical Nutrition uh, so so Christopher Rhodes et al. I believe it's the lab of Angela M. Uh, Zivkovitz um, at UC Davis. So human fasting modulates macrophage function and upregulates multiple bioactive metabolites that extend lifespan in C. elegans, a pilot clinical study. So this is pretty cool. There's, there's a juxtaposition of many things. Um, and um, and uh, one thing that the authors mention is that this is potentially, at least best to their knowledge, the first study to show that uh, periodic fasting is capable of beneficially modifying human plasma uh, functionalities. So basically modifying the, the, the human plasma and modifying the metabolites, the, the concentration of these metabolites in a beneficial manner. Um, and then they test these metabolites um, on the function of macrophages, so um, white blood cells that basically are active in your immune system um, in humans. Uh, so these are in vitro studies, but also very interestingly from an evolutionary perspective, they then uh, test these metabolites uh, on C. elegans. So or small roundworm, right, that we're all familiar with, uh, showing that it can they can extend lifespan. So uh, I think this is like a really cool study from like multiple perspectives. And um, I'm going to stop sharing here. Uh, it raises a lot of intriguing questions. Um, and I think there's a lot of vast potential here to basically expand on the experiments that have been done in this paper. Uh, one of the things that immediately crossed my mind when I read this paper was, um, what's the significance of this uh, of these types of metabolites for uh, the plasma transfer experiments that are being done right now? So uh, there's we've discussed papers in the past um, with regards to plasmapheresis, um, the the you know transfer also of young blood into older animals and the beneficial effects of of diluting blood plasma. So a lot of these um, beneficial effects. Um, seem to arise from diluting out um, compounds that have a negative effect. Um, but this paper here um, intriguingly raises the possibility and identifies um, metabolites that go up um, when you do something beneficial that's been known to have um, a positive effect on human lifespan, such as periodic fasting. So that really raises the question of, of improving uh, blood plasma uh, using or maybe enhancing blood plasma using these types of compounds and also uh, raises an interesting um, new way to um, screen for potential bioactive compounds to be used uh, for medicinal purposes um, using uh, humans uh, in under various uh, conditions such as periodic fasting. So let's go back to the paper and take a look. So that's the manuscript and let's scroll down so um who did they use uh they used 20 young males and females so i believe they had 10 uh 10 young males humans and females um i believe they were between the ages of 20 and 40 um had all normal you know all normal uh 
I'm just going to skip this for a little while here. I'm going to scroll down here. Da -da -da. This is all methods, all right? So, so this is the participants, right? Age, average age is about 27.5. Um, height, weight, BMI, so normal BMI, so healthy, healthy individuals, healthy blood pressure, so on and so forth. And nobody dropped out of the study. Um, so that was that was their that was their population. Um, so it was a clinical trial. Um, <clears throat> And again, it's it's kind of cool. It's a clinical trial, right? But then they're using, um, you know, usually you use <laughs> it kind of it's uh, yeah, it kind of it's it amuses me sometimes when you see things kind of like um, in a way that you don't expect it, right? So usually you you screen for bioactive compounds in C. elegans and then you transfer them to human trial subjects and see how they function. In this case, you use the human trial subjects to to basically identify metabolites that have a medicinal value and then you apply it to C. elegans, right? So, uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's done it that way, but it's, it's uh, anyway. Okay, I found it amusing. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go back. I also found it interesting. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of geeking out a little bit about uh, you know that sort of topsy turviness, but hey, it works. Um, on that on that topic, do you mm -hmm. know why they chose to put multiple studies in one paper? I've seen this a few periodically, where someone will do like six or seven different studies and they shove them all into one paper. Like this feels like the human study would be a paper on its own, and the C. elegans paper would be a study on its own. Like why are they one paper? Yeah, it's well. Um, to be honest, I I. I really, I really thought the C. elegans kind of took it a little bit, made it a little bit special, just because, um, uh, you know, as as a biologist, you, you think, you know, a lot, everything is, you know, everything is evolutionarily related, right? But then, then of course, when you when when you're looking for fundamental mechanisms of aging or or things that um, affect longevity, um, you also think that, you know, the more fundamental it is, the more um, cross species, um, it's going to be, or, you know, the behavior is going to be. Um, so it's really intriguing to see, um, these metabolites, which go up in human, um, blood plasma actually having, uh, a, 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 a very significant, easily kind of seen effect on C. elegans, um, you know, which kind of bodes well for using these, you know, metabolites or derivatives thereof as, as, you know, supplementation for humans, because, you know, if, if you derive it from humans and it goes up in humans and having potentially a beneficial effect in vitro on, on human macrophages, um, and then it's working on C. elegans, then you would think it would work on other human patients, um, because it's, it's probably hitting some really fundamental, um, mechanisms that, uh, play a role in longevity. Um, you know, they could have, they could have certainly, you know, uh, used a whole bunch of other, you know, organisms. Um, you know, another potential experiment I was thinking of was, 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 well, how did these factors affect replicative versus chronological lifespan in yeast, for example, or people are now working with zebrafish and water daphnia and so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, I guess they so, could, yeah. So in your opinion, the, they did this, the study was intended to beyond humans, and then they did the C. elegans just to see, is this something that's likely evolutionary conserved? If so, then it's very likely to work on all humans in the same way it worked on these humans, versus if it doesn't work C. elegans, then it's maybe not as evolutionary conserved, and which means you might have, you know, genetic differences, could be racial differences, sex differences, et cetera. Is that could kind be. of where yeah. you're going? Well, that's where I'm going. I don't think that's where they went. What they, I, I think what they, uh, somewhere in the paper. So some of the compounds were already shown to have an effect on C. elegans. So I think when they went through the metabolites, they, they spotted some that were previously published to have a beneficial effect on C. elegans, such as spermidine, for example. So I think when they saw that, it, it, somebody in the lab must have said, hey, wait a minute, these, some of these compounds, have, some of these metabolites already extend lifespan in C. elegans. Um, why don't we just combine all the other ones and see if they also have an extension, you know, extending effect on C. elegans. It may, it may have been just that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I guess, I guess they worked as well. Um, but that being said, um, I think what you mentioned, Micah, that, you know, if it works in C. elegans, you know, derived from humans, 
um, that's probably a pretty strong argument that it's, um, you know, it's going to have robust effects amongst uh, many other humans, you know, with, with all the other, you know, differences that we have, you know, male, female, um, you know, different body weight, different age, different ethnicities, you know, different enzyme levels of various sorts, so on and so forth. Um, okay, so uh, so what do they do with this experiment and how do they set it up? So the other thing that they mentioned is that they had a slightly different protocol that most people do with periodic fasting. And they used, I guess to take out a lot of the differences, they, they used, um, they used all the subjects as their own controls, uh, meaning that you know everybody everybody had their own baseline, fed, fasted, refed, so it wasn't two separate groups, um, and they all also stuck to the same diet, uh, meaning that they you know when they chose these participants, um, they they went you know I guess they went through, I mean this is the you know uh, Journal of Clinical Nutrition and it's the Department of Nutrition so. These guys were really paying attention to the type of nutrition these folks were having and trying to really standardize it. So they weren't giving a different, like a standard diet that these folks weren't in, like uh, usually eating. But they, I think they, um, they picked normal people and they, you know, screened them for the type of diet they already eat, and they basically ate the same meal. So it wasn't throwing their, their metabolic systems kind of a little bit out of whack, right? Something that they were not accustomed to eating. Um, and then they then they monitored them to make sure that um, that they actually were sticking to their fast. So they were doing glucose monitoring and you know and and making sure everybody kept the um, uh, yeah, I like that. stuck to the diet. Yeah, I like that is so much more reliable than asking people to self report. Did you stick to the diet um, versus uh, just getting a blood glucose, blood glucose monitor and watching? Yep. So they so 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 they had so they had four kind of time points um, that they did blood draws um, and um, isolated people's uh, blood and then were able to separate the plasma to, to analyze um, metabolite concentrations and also to um, pull out macrophages for the studies. Now for the studies, they say that they, they, um, they did an in vitro assay, they isolated macrophages from everybody, but they, uh, we'll get into the study in a, in a, in a moment, but they, I think they, they took um, macrophages from uh, one one guy, one of the patients that was giving kind of the most consistent responses, and they use that sort of as the as so that's kind of interesting too. They, they use the the isolated macrophages from one of the participants as as a um, as a screen, uh, you know, to to test for the effects of these various metabolites, which then they um, then they apply to uh, C. elegans. Okay, so day one. Um, so they, uh, 8 a.m., they, they slept overnight, woke up, and that's their baseline overnight fasted state. So I don't know how long they slept, I guess eight hours plus or minus. Um, and, you know, then they ate, everything was fine. Then two hours after they ate, um, it was postprandial. So that's the fed state. So they get another blood draw here. <clears throat> so this is after they're, they're well fed. And now begins the 36-hour uh, fast. So glucose monitoring, um, 8 p.m., to uh, 8 a.m. the next day, um, they do another blood draw. That's the fasted. So this is the one where you expect, you know, your metabolite concentrations to really uh, vary quite a bit. Um, and then, uh, and then afterwards, you know, it's uh, after the fast state is over, you know, they go back to normal and they do another blood draw um, after two hours after the last meal post perennial refed right, um, to see how much things have reset. And it's interesting, some of the effects actually kind of in the, from the fasted state um, linger past like one extra day to the refed state. So they, they noted that for, for some of the things. Um, wasn't that dramatic, but there, there was a, um, you know, there was a metabolic kind of uh, echo, if you will, of the fasted state that went on for another day. Um, so it's a very short protocol. You know, so everybody was able to adhere to this and they were able to get some, you know, pretty, pretty good data from just 20 participants um, on this, on this trial, three day clinical trial. Um, so, you know, kind of a nice tight protocol. Um, okay. So here's all the, all the stuff that they do. Um, and, uh, and then this is, and this is, then they're, they're measuring various, you know, to make sure also that, um, when they 
take all these points to make to see that uh, you know things look normal after the fast and then the refed state and so forth. They they are measuring various um, you know uh, states, uh, if you will, of of the uh, blood of the participants, such as ketone bodies, right? So. Um, uh, fat is being metabolized. So fed, you got 187 um, micromoles per liter, then that jumps to 2,284 during the fasted state, then drops back down to the uh, refed state. Um, they noticed that, I, they kind of mentioned this in passing, you know, they look at cholesterol levels. Um, I'm not sure why LDL cholesterol kind of spikes a little bit fasted and um, that doesn't affect HDL. So I don't really know too much about cholesterol metabolism. Um, they don't really mention too much about that. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, it seems there's something significant about that enough that the authors would mention it um, and then kind of don't mention it again. So again, I'm not really a nutritionist, so I don't know. Um, but this was mainly done to, you know, make sure that the participants were adhering to everything and that everything was normal. <clears throat> and I'm assuming that all of these numbers here are normal for people that are, that are undergoing, you know, baseline fed, fasted, refed. Um, so that's sort of, uh, that's sort of the background. Now we get into um, the actual participant plasma. So figure two. So they have a number of different assays here um, that they that they do. Um, so these are all the different subjects um, in different colors, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, twenty. Um, I don't know which are males and females. So um, maybe the colors are mentioned somewhere, which are males and females, but I don't really kind of recall that. Um, uh, so these are different. So what they're doing in these assays is this is what I mentioned before. Uh, they, assays were performed to duplicate using primary human macrophage from a single healthy donor. I believe it was a male donor. Um, for some of the assays, they required more macrophages. So they actually got a different macrophage that was like, they were able to expand in culture from ATCC. So differentiated THP1 macrophage, that was experiments E through G. So the NOS activity, nitrous oxide synthase activity, uh, arginase activity, COX activity was done on that macrophage. Um, so these are in vitro assays. <clears throat> and what they're doing is then from for, um, baseline fed, fasted, refed. So these, um, I don't know what, A, A, B, B, let's see, what are these? Um, I'm not really sure what those letters mean. Um, those are all the different participants here. And these are all the different participants. Um, and these are basically, all these lines are basically corresponding to a single participant. And that's the plasma from these participants. And that plasma is basically administered to the particular assay that they're doing using that macrophage. Um, and I'm just gonna stop sharing for, your, for a little moment. So um, basically what they're looking at is, uh, Stop sharing here. See if I could share my screen with. Uh, does that look kind of clear? Yep. Okay. So yeah. So they're looking at a bunch of assays here. Um, so they're basically measuring things that are corresponding to, um, uh, well, intracellular st stress and also inflammation, right? So. Uh, so they'll be looking at um, TNF alpha, um, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is a cytokine, um, and this is just the pathway it binds to um, different types of receptors, and there's different downstream effects, but basically activates macrophages to promote an inflammatory response. Um, some of the other assays that they're looking at um, is uh, the synthesis of nitric oxide. So just um, just to remind ourselves, nitric oxide was um, discovered. I don't, not too long ago, it was in the 1980s or so. It's an interesting signaling molecule. It's a gas that's released by endothelial cells. Um, and it's uh, basically synthesized through the breakdown of an amino acid, um, arginine, which has all these nitrogen groups, right? Um, and when it's synthesized by this nitric oxide synthase, it can diffuse readily um, into smooth muscles which surround, I believe, arterioles. Um, and this causes relaxation of these smooth muscles. So basically, um, nitric oxide synthase converts it to nitric oxide. 
you have now, um, and this is, you know, know all these different pathways, um, but basically arginase is another enzyme that can, that can cause arginine to be broken down into a variety of other compounds. Um, so if your arginase activity goes up, then less of it is being shunted into nitric oxide. So if nitric oxide levels go up, arginase activity is down. So I'm just mentioning this because they, they use this as an assay later. Um, they look at arginase activity. Uh, interestingly, that also causes spermidine levels to go up, which is, which is a compound um, that is shown to have beneficial effects. Uh, so, so what happens is, is uh, well, there's a whole bunch of different steps here, but uh, the nitric oxide activates um, protein kinase G, and that causes essentially this muscle to relax. Um, and the relaxation of the muscle um, causes your blood vessels to dilate, and that's part of the inflammatory response, right? Redness and swelling with heat and pain. So those are kind of the, the primary, um, you know, uh, symptoms of the inflammatory response, and that allows um, all sorts of uh, macrophages and other cells to come in. Uh, so if you have a wound or if you have some sort of um, damage there or an infection, they can come in and, and um, all your immune system can get to work. Um, but of course, as we've mentioned before, um, too much of a good thing is too much, right? So then if you, if you have inflammatory responses happening all the time, uh, that could be, you know, that could be bad. Um, just interesting aside, right? Um, we take drugs uh, that simulate that basically cause um, nitric oxide to be produced. Uh, you know, if we have chest pains, and those are derived just, uh, uh, just I don't know. I thought this was fun to mention. Um, nitroglycerin, which is a high explosive, um, we actually take that as a as a drug, and this nitroglycerin here with all these nitrate groups. Um, that are highly explosive get decomposed, I believe, by enzymes in your body and release NO, um, which does the same job as I mentioned in the previous slides. It causes dilation of, of your blood vessels. So if your heart is too, blood vessels are too constricted, um, blood flow is blocked, you have chest pains, um, this allows those blood vessels to dilate a little bit better. Um, so that's a little bit of background there. So sorry to bore you with that, but uh, using that as a basis for their assays, at least those enzymes um, and nitric oxide to basically uh, measure the inflammatory response, um, but they won't be using nitroglycerin. Um, so let's go back to the paper. Okay, so there's the NOS activity. There's the arginase activity that I mentioned. Uh, cyclooxygenase um, is also an enzyme that's, I believe, used to synthesize like prostaglandins and other types of um, uh, other types of um, downstream factors which mediate the pain response. So that's also implicated in inflammation. This assay here um, is this. It's. Uh, hmm. Uh, it's like a fibrinogen assay that's used to activate macrophages, and it's uh, a measure of, I believe, uh, TNF alpha activity, uh, intracellular reactive oxygen species assay, which they mentioned. It's, uh, I believe, it's a, it's a fluorescence-based assay to measure um, reactive oxygen species that uh, um, they got it at a kit from Abcam. Um, antioxidant capacity also is, uh, I believe, a kit-based assay uh, to measure how many antioxidants are being produced by the macrophages. Um, so you add in a reagent, and if more of the enzymes are being produced, um, well, you have more antioxidant activity. Um, and also cholesterol efflux. Now, I'm not really sure about, um, again, how cholesterol efflux pertains to an anti-inflammatory response. So looking at all of these, you know, kind of numbers here, um, you could see that you know uh, nitric oxide synthase activity goes down, um, arginase activity goes a bit up, um, cyclooxygenase activity goes down, antioxidant capacity um, goes up, intracellular reactive oxygen species go down, and also um, TNF alpha uh, activity goes down as well. So they're showing that it's, you know, that the participant plasma, if they introduce it to a macrophage um, after they've taken it from these subjects, um, there's, you know, uh, there's trends that they notice 
note that you know that correspond to what you would expect from anti-inflammatory activity in general. Um, so I don't know if anybody has questions on this. I thought it was interesting that they used the patient cells from the study here as a as a uh, as a screen or a means of assay. Okay. So uh, what do they do next? So what they do next is they um, they send out the plasma to a company where they do a meta metabolome um, kind of uh, analysis. So I think they use um, uh, I think they use high pressure liquid chromatography and other. Uh, I mentioned it up here somewhere. Polarization assay. Um, yep. So conducted at Metabolon Inc. Uh, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, and um, positive ionization chromatography. So they take the plasma and they look at plasma from baseline fed, fasted, and um, refed. So, you know, they have a volcano plot that shows, oops, volcano plot that shows a whole bunch of factors that are upregulated significantly, ones that are um, downregulated. Um, I believe this is, uh, yeah, principal common analysis of complete met metabolite data sets between baseline fed, fast, and refed states. Um, I think this plot here, A, is, I mentioned that? Yeah, fasted metabolite levels, right? And this is all the other times. So you could see a cluster here of, you know, of the ones that are the most different. And I don't know how many exactly. Um, I think it was like 300 different ones. Um, and then they analyzed the ones that had the kind of, they used, um, they used the compounds in kind of a similar assay that was developed up here. And the ones that had the most kind of robust effects, um, they, they kind of windowed it down to um, like four or five, which I'll mention later. Um, so there's beta hydroxybutyrate, um, there's spermidine, um, there's one methyl nicotinamide, palmitol ethanolamide, um, so on and so forth. So a whole bunch of different metabolites, um, and these are the metabolites that you know fall into various categories that are upregulated in response to fasting versus the ones that are downregulated. Um, and you can see that now when they isolate these compounds, so I guess they're available probably through sigma. You can get a lot of these compounds that your body produces. Um, certainly, you know, spermidine, but um, a whole bunch of others. You, you can get them synthesized and then basically uh, add them into, um, you know, add them into uh, into a media and see their effects. So uh, let's see, what are they doing here? C, D, E, which. Um, Circulating levels. So are they doing an assay yet on this one or are they looking at levels? Just, they do an assay in the next figure. Just trying to remind myself here. Oh, I think they're just looking at the levels of these particular ones. Okay, in this, in this figure here, circulating levels. Uh, Yeah. Okay. So these are just these are just um, these are just the levels. So they note that also that the levels vary quite dramatically between um, between participants. Uh, I think they mentioned in the paper it's like fourteen fold difference. So um, so there is there is quite a, a dramatic difference. Um, you know, even even in this kind of tight assay with 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 twenty participants that are all young and healthy, um, there is still quite quite a variation variability. Um, one thing I kind of noted is that when they do these experiments later, when they identify these compounds that kind of go up the most, um, these metabolites, and again, some of them have already been shown to have beneficial effects such as spermidine. Um, they're looking at, they're assaying compounds that are having beneficial effects. Um, one thing, you know, it'd be, I would be interested to see because um, I'm going to pause here for a little a little bit and kind of kind of talk speculate out loud here. Um, I don't think they they used compounds that went down 
with um, uh, with fasting um, as kind of a negative control, um, or maybe compounds that go up if you you know feed yourself, right? So you would think that some of those compounds probably have pro-inflammatory effects and would have maybe a negative effect on lifespan and a ne negative effect uh, on kind of um, various uh, pro longevity pathways, if you will, um, because that's that was speculated to be um, the effect of plasmapheresis is that you're taking away negative compounds, right? So you're diluting out negative compounds. Um, and there, so there could be a, you know, two effects happening in this case, you might be, you know, increasing positive compounds and taking away negative compounds. So it'd be interesting for me to see if there are certain metabolites that go up um, with feeding or go down with fasting that if you introduce into the assays that the researchers here do, such as, um, you know, the C. elegans study, whether or not those would decrease the lifespan of C. elegans. Uh, I know we're interested in seeing things that increase lifespan, but I just, I just thought that would be interesting from a human perspective to see if we're churning out these factors that have a negative effect as well. Um, could all agree to disagree, but that was something that crossed my mind. Yeah. Out of curiosity, do you, do you know why they just did 36 hours instead of something longer? Is it just compliance issues or did they spend um, some reason for 36 hours? Well, they mentioned, I think compliance is part of it, but they mention up here that, you know, that the definition of periodic fasting is, is greater than or equal to 24 hours. So I don't know if a 36 hours is like a, is a standard based on, on some, you know, um, it's a good question. Like why, why not 48 hours? Why not 96 hours? Do you get a more robust effect? I'm not sure. I believe the, the evidence that I'm aware of, it, which is, is fairly weak. I haven't seen anything super strong suggests that longer fast tend to uh, be more effective for the things like autophagy and stuff that you want. Like as, mm -hmm. as you go longer and longer, more and more cleanup kicks in is the theory. And so mm -hmm. 36 just felt short. Like 36 is just, I forgot to eat today. <laughs> um, whereas, you know, 72 is much more in the lines of something's very, very significant has just changed in your life. And so I was just surprised by the, the short duration as well. Yeah. And surprisingly they, they managed to get, um, you know, they managed to get um, metabolites that uh, seem yeah. to be having an effect within that. So, I mean, that kind of bodes well. It's, uh, uh, yeah, definitely that, well. yeah. So, and, you know, and I think there's a lot of, there's like, um, so that I, I made some notes to myself here. Um, so like you said, um, periodic fasting. Um, so I wrote down longer fasting, um, also, you know, longer calorie restriction, you know? Uh, so yeah, so definitely, you know, people, people, fast for much longer periods of time. So it'd be interesting to see what, um, uh, what effects, um, you know, long, longer duration uh, CR would have, right? Um, or people that have been practicing CR for a while. Um, but, at that, but at that point, you're probably, um, you know, putting in a lot of variability because now you're, you're comparing two different sets of people, right? A control group that's not CR and, and a group that is CR versus here, they're, you know, they're, um, uh, they're using themselves as a control. Um, that being said, you know, uh, uh, before we go forward a little, little bit more, I mean, you know, if there are, the, if we do have this sort of pharmacopoeia of beneficial, you know, compounds that our body produces during, you know, certain stages, um, and it's in, they could be, you know, they could be turned into drugs and they're, they're in our blood. Um, what other types of, um, uh, plasma could we be looking at? Could we be looking at plasma of supercentenarians, right? Is there a difference between, between different um, genetic groups of humans um, that have potentially beneficial plasma components um, versus, you know, people that um, alter their environment through fasting? So um, I think there's like a lot of different uh, directions, like a lot of different follow-ups that could be done with this paper, um, which is pretty cool. There's like many other variables that could be looked at. Uh, okay, so so now they're looking. So now they, you know, isolated a whole bunch of these compounds. Um, uh, I think BHB is what is that? Beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, they get yeah. They give them acronyms. So 
uh, palmitoyl ethanolamide, one methyl nicotinamide, spermidine, right? So, and then they're all abbreviated here. Um, uh, one MNA, PEA, OEA. I think those are the ones that gave the kind of the um, most robust responses uh, in assays that they that they performed earlier. So what they're looking at here is they're looking at so they've identified these compounds. Uh, this is these are assays. So they're looking at different concentrations. So they're looking at um, so this CF. The ICS is, is basically looking at, I think, expression of TNF alpha, uh, and then intracellular ROS, COX activity, cyclooxygenase activity, uh, nitric oxide synthase activity, arginase activity. So this, uh, you know, this is all basically um, indicators for inflammatory responses. These are concentrations of the different compounds. Uh, so they're using a macrophage here, I believe that's yeah, isolated from a single healthy donor or for some of the assays, a differentiated macrophage from ATCC, that's E and F, the NOS activity and arginase activity. Um, they have a negative control, which is basically cells that, um, cells that are not stimulated. Um, let's see, what's the positive control here? Um, uh, I think the positive control is, so, Cells are, let's see, cells are stimulated. Uh, let's see, TNF alpha levels from unstimulated macrophage, and TNF alpha levels from stimulated macrophage. So they use this, this fibrinogen assay, which basically um, kind of perturbs the macrophages and um, gives them an inflammatory response. Um, and then they, so that's the positive control. Um, and A is, is uh, unstimulated with anything. And then to the stimulated cells, they add these compounds. Uh, so they basically inhibit, um, they inhibit uh, the response. So, so this is the, I believe, uh, that's the positive control is up here at the line and different concentrations of BHB. So you can see that there's, a, there's an inhibitory response, um, you know, uh, the higher the concentration levels go for these compounds. And based on this, they, they pick various concentrations that they then apply uh, to these assays. So these are spermidine, MNA, PEA, OEA, and this is a combo. Combo is, I believe, all four of those compounds uh, together, which has kind of a more robust response. So you could see, you know, with, uh, this tumor necrosis factor alpha release assay, uh, you you have you know quite a significant you know blockage of TNF alpha uh, with this um, combination of compounds. Um, you know, so you have various effects of blockage for single compounds, but you could note here for a lot of these, uh, the response is you know better in some cases. So you know decreased in intracellular reactive oxygen species. Um, when you add this combination of, of, of compounds, um, nitric oxide synthase activity goes down, and of course, um, related to that, arginase activity goes up, uh, so on and so forth. So all of these compounds, either individually or definitely in combination, have a significant effect on you know, these anti-inflammatory assays uh, that they're performing. Uh, so that's one thing that they show. And next is the actual C. elegans. So they do a combination of these and it's quite dramatic. Uh, so they've noted spermidine has an increase, you know, in earlier assays. And I think maybe some of these compounds before, but, um, but this combination is, is, you know, it's, it's, uh, they mentioned it's a 96% increase in lifespan. Um, that's your control. It's 120 worms. Um, and well, you know, I'll just let the data speak for itself. Uh, there's the percent survival curve. Um, you know, I don't know why PEA alone, you know, it looks like some, some are living much longer than average, but you know, that just could be a statistical fluke at that point. Once you get, once you get to that level of, um, um, you know, a few worms that are left. Um, but you can, you know, see a dramatic effect here. The combo here is all four of the others. Is that correct? Yeah, so let's see, what does it say? Yeah, OE uh, combo, let's take a look here. I believe it's all four, but let me just double check here. 
Um, that's a lot of stuff in this figure legend. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, all four metabolites. Yeah. So, okay. so, and they have the concentrations here that they treated the macrophages. I'm not. Sure, I, it might be the same concentrations they used in the also the worm assay, but they don't. They don't. Um, it's probably somewhere buried. So, yeah, one MNA, PEA, OEA, and spermidine. Be nice in a perhaps follow-up study to try to do the combinatorial set of of these four. See if there's two or three that are doing most of the work. Yes, definitely. Um, so uh, that's the data in the paper. There's, um, I thought the data was, you know, fairly fairly clean. Um, they tried to make it as tight as possible with with participants that they had, which was, you know, a small group of people, all healthy and also uh, utilizing themselves as controls. Um, uh, Steve says spermidine is found in some hard cheeses. Good news if you are a cheese connoisseur. I am a cheese connoisseur, so. It's good. Um, but I thought, you know, I thought this paper was intriguing from kind of many angles, one of them being, you know, kind of plundering our own blood plasma as a pharmacopoeia, you know, for um, beneficial compounds. Um, like I said before, usually we, we go out in nature and we find these compounds and we bring them in. So actually seeing these metabolites fluctuate and then seeing them have a beneficial effect, at least in vitro, um, for human macrophages, uh, and then having a significant extension of lifespan for C. elegans, I think bodes well if they're introduced uh, into humans as sort of um, what the authors mentioned, um, periodic fasting mimetics, right? Because some people can't periodically fast for a variety of reasons. Maybe, you know, they there's whatever their, you know, condition is, um, it's, it's contraindicated for them to to fast, they need to keep their nutritional um, intake um, higher, or at least their calorie intake higher. So, so having these compounds um, as therapeutics um, would, you know, would uh, would serve the same purpose. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot more, you know, that could be done to identify these compounds. And like I mentioned before. Uh, what role would these compounds play with regards to flat plasma phoresis, right? So we've, you know, papers we've looked at uh, before um, from the Convoy lab and others, you know, show that dilution of negative factors, you know, plays a strong role in, in kind of um, uh, promoting various, um, I guess, various states of good health. Um, in individuals that undergo this this therapy, but you know, is all plasma created the same? And this paper suggests no, that you know, you could have better plasma um, if the plasma is derived from individuals that are periodically fasted. And the reason it's better is because certain metabolites that have beneficial effects, um, which they identify, I think for the first time in this paper, some of them um, that have anti-inflammatory effects um, go up. So. Um, so that that adds you know a positive spin um, to some of these plasma paresis experiments where where you're not just taking out bad compounds or diluting bad compounds potentially, but um, you're you could potentially be putting in um, good compounds that are these metabolites and these metabolites have powerful anti-inflammatory effects. Um, so yeah, um, I'll open it for discussion at this point, I guess. No, yes, we my, only, my only discussion point is just an annoyance at the use of the term periodic fasting, intermittent fasting. I feel like the person mm. who defined those didn't know the definition of either of those words and they got them backwards. Periodic is something that happens on a regular schedule and inter doing time restricted feeding is very periodic. You know, every day, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. you don't eat or whatever. Meanwhile, intermittent means not periodic, the opposite basically, not on a regular schedule. And, you know, not eating for three days straight, a couple of times a year is very intermittent. It is not periodic. So that's my only, my only real comment on this paper. And it's not about the paper, it's just about the fields as a whole. I don't know who came up with those. Gotcha. Names. Point point noted. This was this was a single instant <laughs> of this this was this was a single instant of either intermittent or periodic fasting. <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah, exactly. It, wasn't, it definitely wasn't periodic for this study, at least. 
Right. Well, well yeah. Okay. It was it was a single in, incident of intermittent fasting. It wasn't a single in, incident of, of periodic fasting because they did. Yes. As far as I know, these participants didn't continue with their the periodicity right. of this fasting regimen. They they probably finished it after the study and went back to normal. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So I think the the paper is interesting. I think the I'd like like I mentioned earlier. I'd like to see a follow up that. Um, teased out, you know, which of those four compounds is the most impactful. It's very, it's very possible, like, you know, two of those did 90% of the work and the other two didn't, or yeah. three did all the work. Um, or it's possible, you know, you don't get the benefits until you hit all four. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, <laughs> it was interesting results. Um, I'd like to also see, I'd be very curious to see, see the basically the same style of study designs, but with a longer fast. And I remember mm -hmm. when I was getting compliance is certainly hard for their, a 72 hours fast, for example, and arguably you need to titrate people into it, you know, give them practice, wait a month, give them practice, wait a month, because it is very hard. I've done it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm, I don't think anyone's really looked deeply at, at this same sort of data and tried to figure out, you know, what, what exactly does change in the metabolome over those three days and, you know, how much of that then carries on for some number of days afterwards. There's a lot of speculation, you know, we, we think, you know, ketosis increase and um, autophagy, but I don't think anyone's really done a good, robust study. So it'd be nice to see that as well as a follow-up. Yeah. And, and again, uh, another thing that's intriguing to me is that, you know, um, when we look at metabolites, when people look at metabolites in the blood in response to various treatments, you know, it's, you look at it from a diagnostic perspective, but in this case, they're like, oh, they, they go up. So maybe they could be also having a therapeutic, you know, um, you know, yeah. role. So it's, it's, you know, so that's, uh, and, and potentially the answer here is yes, it's not just diagnostic, but you know, it's the, you know, it's actually having a, a therapeutic role as well. Um, sure. yeah. I wonder if you do the same thing for, for exercise. Exercise is the other big thing that's well yeah. known to just mm -hmm. have huge positive effects. If you do it, I wonder if we could just look at the metabolome and see, you know, what, I agree. what's going on when you, when you do exercise and can we turn that into a pill or a diet or a supplement or whatever? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of you know the, again like using the same exact experimental template, you could look at longer longer periods of fasting, you know, CR, um, larger populations, right? Because this is only twenty individuals. Um, yep. You could also look at um, not just different environmental effects, such as you mentioned, um, exercise is was one of them, either sing, you know alone or in combination with with some of these other interventions, um, but also looking at you know, different, um, you know, uh, different genetic subpopulations, people that are super centenarians, you know, or, you know, for example, um, or people that, you know, that seem to have, you know, um, you know, healthier than average for their age or, or looking, or even looking at the metabolome, you know, looking at the me metabolome of plasma of, you know, people that uh, score very well on their biological aging clock, you know, using the methylation status uh, as, as a metric, right? So if, take somebody who's, you know, take a group of people that uh, are chronologically 50, but are biologically 20, right? Is their blood plasma different, you know, and does it, would you get similar type of correlation with, with, with fasting or is, or is there now a different group of metabolites? That 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 kind of um, changes, right? So, so there's yeah, so there's there's so many other fascinating follow-ups, um, um, and then of course even the assays themselves. Um, you just tested this on C. elegans, but um, you know uh, there's a whole bunch of other model organisms that you can you can you can test as well to see how much you know cross species activity uh, these compounds have. Um, do they have different effects on replicative versus chronological lifespan for yeast? You know, that's kind of more of a more interesting from a, from an evolutionary biology, uh, you know, evolutionary biology perspective. Um, but there's there's a lot of I think there's a lot of intriguing follow up experiments that could be could be done with this um, based on this paper. So so in that regard, I, I think this paper, you know, hits a couple, couple of groundbreaking kind of, um, you know, uh, points here you know one of them is using using the you know the human plasma um, under conditions that are beneficial and could potentially extend lifespan and using it to basically um, screen for bioactive compounds that could be used as therapeutics um, 
that's I don't think that's a very common approach um, for for looking for you know pharmacologically active compounds that could be converted into drugs. Um, I don't think so. I, besides this paper, I there there can't be there can't be that many other papers that have, have used this type of approach. Um, to you, you mentioned um, supercentenarians, and mm -hmm. I believe about 20 years ago, Steve Coles with the Gerontology Research Group started the supercentenarian research project and took blood draws from supercentenarians. I'm not sure where that data is, but I believe it can be acquired if you wanted to analyze it or if anyone in the audience wants to analyze it. Well, the company that does the analysis is right here in the paper, Metabolome Inc. <laughs> you could just send that, send those samples over there, and you know, and you could uh, um, get your, you know, get get your uh, metabolite concentrations. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, very very intriguing. I think there's like there's a, you know, there's a high kind of, well, I say this in a good way, novelty factor to this paper. Um, and and to what what the authors kind of set out to do, um, and it you know it seems um, even with this very small tight study with with um, twenty participants, um, they got some they got some very um, uh, intriguing data um, that uh, kind of bodes well for further follow ups using this type of methodology. You know, maybe even using other assays as well, right? Because um, they use this macrophage, you know, inf inflammation assay. But there's probably a whole bunch of other assays that that we can we can imagine um, that we can apply the the blood plasma constituents to and see if they have bioactive uh, effects with regards to you know uh, various pro longevity pathways. Um, you know, whether or not they induce autophagy or or other types of things downstream as well, right? So. So there's a whole bunch of other assays that can be performed as well on these metabolites. Um, so that's it. That's the paper. Um, you know, and for all those reasons, I, I enjoyed it. Um, something new, a uh, new approach. Um, you know, in science, you know, we always need new approaches, different ways of looking at things. And I think, you know, this paper looked at um, looked at metabolites, not just from a diagnostic perspective in humans, but also as a therapeutic potential, you know, source of therapeutics as well. Um, and, you know, and, and using, using the human plasma as sort of a, a pharmacopoeia is quite intriguing. And then using those drugs that we identified from humans and applying them cross species is also kind of uh, a further novel um, application of, of the, um, of the, uh, the data de they derive from these experiments. So uh, that's all I have. <laughs> all right. So we've got more papers. So I've got a couple of papers that I'm looking at, Steve, for next month. Um, I'll send them your way. Um, there's a, yeah. So there's an interesting paper on um, a potential cure for ALS using using antisense RNAs um, and potentially other types of, uh, you know, we don't really think of ALS, um, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, you know, which is a, a, a neuropathy where you basically have degeneration of motor neurons as a, a sort of a disease of aging, although it, it is correlated with, with age. Uh, but intriguingly, <clears throat> one of the proteins that that um, uh, that goes wrong in a lot of uh, supposed, you know, purportedly in a lot of ALS patients, I didn't know this, um, and also for some types of um, uh, dementia is uh, is a protein that's associated with microtubules, uh, staphmin, and I believe it 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 aggregates, um, and there's some downstream effects. So it's kind of interesting um, because obviously protein aggregates play a role in various um, pathologies of aging, such as Alzheimer's. So um, that's a paper that I'm looking at. I'll pass that your way, Steve. But there's a couple of other papers as well that were recently published. So, you know, that's that's the that's the beauty of this field and also the kind of the, the problem is keeping up, right? You, you find a paper that's cool. It's like, I think I'm going to do this for next month. And then, you know, two weeks later, something else comes up and it's like, we got to do this one. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I just read the other one. <laughs> Should we do the one that just came out 24 hours ago? My, uh, thought, is, my thought is that um, ALS is not 
a common feature of aging in everyone. So I would tend to look for things that have more to do with common features of aging. Um, yes, I, I, I tend to agree with that, except um, we don't have any good cures for it in this paper actually um, actually uh, developed what is potentially a viable therapeutic um, using an injection of um, antisense RNAs um, directly into the cerebrospinal fluid of mm -hmm. model, model mice and then showed um, a complete reversal of effects and a growth of motor neurons, which was, which was quite impressive. Um, there is a, there's a, there's a loose, can I, right? Like I, I, you, I could tie it in if I, you know, because it, it is, there is, um, there is a, uh, protein aggregation plays a role where it deactivates one of the proteins. Yeah, I found, I found, I can send that paper your way, but I found it interesting because the protein aggregates themselves didn't seem to do the negative effect but what what the problem was was that by by aggregating they were not able to do something downstream i, I forgot what it was um it was involved in 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 basically properly splicing um uh one of the factors that was required um for motor neuron survival so by adding in the antisense they were able to basically take over the role of the protein that was aggregated um and basically you know fix fix the functionality downstream. So I found it intriguing because, you know, usually when we think of protein aggregates, we think of aggregates being the toxic factor, especially with beta amyloids and neurofibrillary tangles. Um, but in this case, it seemed that the aggregates weren't the toxic driver per se, but basically were losing a function, were not performing a functionality downstream, which could be then taken over using this antisense RNA, and then the cells were fine despite the fact that you still had these aggregates, right? So mm, interesting, right? Um, that, you know, does, does, that, does that suggest that there might be some downstream effects, um, you know, of, uh, that are being lost, you know, by having neurofibrillary tangles, so these hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, maybe, maybe those aggregates themselves aren't causing most of the problem, but the loss of their functionality is and that could be repaired somehow despite the fact that you still have these aggregates and and regain the functionality of those neurons in people who have alzheimer's disease anyway just some food for thought um not not quite you know getting to you know the fundamentals of aging perhaps but still some interesting things to discuss anyway that was that was one paper that i was reading and there's a bunch of others as well so but that's for that's for uh, that's for next month. Maybe we won't do that. Maybe we'll do something else. Well, it is fascinating that that they were able to treat and and reverse the ill the ill effects. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's always it's always cool to see something that potentially could immediately be applied as a therapeutic in humans. You know. Um, so that's that was another. Uh, you know. Kind of check mark for me because obviously it's a devastating disease um you know not directly related to aging but you know some as some facets you know with such as the protein aggregation angle yeah and maybe that would spark some you know some thinking along those lines with you know for folks that are studying alzheimer's disease and are doing research in that direction you know to to think maybe a little bit more outside the box when it comes to protein aggregates and their and their um, their functionality or misfunctionality. Misfunctionality sounds like Mis some kind of beauty pageant to me. That's the one I would win. I would win the mis misfunction mis misfunctionality mis dysfunctionality <laughs> contest. <laughs> oh dear, but yes, there's always something new. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. There's quite a lot of stuff that's, you know, going into human trials in the nearby future, or, or is already in. So, I think there's there's, there's potentially lots of uh, discussion um, to be had. So don't worry, Oliver, you're not going to run out of uh, topics for the journal club. Mm -hmm. We can barely keep up with the blooming news. It's so fast. There's so yeah. much going on. So, 
but there you go. So if you want to keep up to speed anyway, I would suggest that the best place, right, Oliver, would be, what's that conference? Oh, yeah. We're doing oh. that conference, aren't we? In New Any York. Ending Age Related Diseases Conference. I can't even keep up. What is it? Number six? Number five? Number 10? It's not no. quite 10. Six. Not ten. six. It, 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 it is our sixth year. Um, we, are, we are over the hump. We are close, closer to 10 than we are to one. We, after this uh, we are indeed. And um, so the good news uh, is that we're definitely going to be back in New York City. We don't know what the venue is. It's TBC. But the even better news is that not only are we going to be doing a physical conference, we are actually definitely going to be doing a virtual uh, conference too. So it's a hybrid conference. So you'll be able to either turn up and enjoy the good food and, 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 and such like networking and all the cool stuff that happens at physical conferences. Or if you're on the other side of the globe and it's a little bit too far, you, you know, there's going to be a cheaper option to uh, watch it online and join in as well. So uh, we're about to, um, not long now, we're going to be announcing some speakers and things. And um, if you want to know more about the conference anyway, it's on Lifespan dot io forward slash e a r d erd for sh uh, for short um you can find out more on there uh, keep your eyes on that and if you've been in the previous years and you think well what the hey you guys already do a good job i don't know it'll be good the tickets are available now so uh you know but yeah we, we definitely guarantee it's going to be um quite a spectacle this year we're pulling out all the stops um can't say much more about that but yeah, there's some there's some pretty exciting things going on, and that's about that's about it from our sponsors. So uh, thanks very much, our sponsors. Can you really sponsor yourself? So anyway, anyway, as always, thanks to uh, the Lifespan Heroes, uh, patrons that support us monthly and allow us to do this, and the myriad of other amazing things that we're doing, the news, the educational stuff the advocacy, all sorts of stuff. Um, so thanks to everybody who's here and who's also a hero, who's not necessarily here, but thanks uh, anyway. And um, I guess, Oliver, you will use the usual channels to let everybody know what we're going to be talking about uh, next time. Can I, can I ask that when the email goes out, it links to the paper because I had to find the paper searching for it rather than the um, link hmm. should be linked there well I haven't, it I would, I would, I would, can i ask that he, uh, if it wasn't then i hmm. think it, in the email oh, yeah. the email i got was was linked this month so the uh, invite had had the paper the email announcement did not ah uh, uh, so the um the email announcement like one, didn't the email yeah, announcement the one, doesn't, the one i'm looking at doesn't yeah, the one that goes to like Lifespan Heroes saying you're invited to Journal Club, blah, blah, blah. That one did not have a link to the paper. The meeting invite did. And they, yeah. And so I, yeah. I also went to the announcement first. I found it through, I found the, the sort of the, the, the invite somewhere on the web and got the paper from that. And obviously, yeah. you, you can find these things, but it'd be nice to be certain it was the right paper, which it was. Yeah, there's also, uh, it's also worth noting on the website if you're logged in. Um, there's also um, a section in the news drop down. You can mm. look at um, uh, Heroes Corner. Um, but yes, you got the invite because I wrote the email the inviting everybody. Um, the circular email that goes out, that seems to be omitted. So I will have that person flogged. It wasn't me. <laughs> I'll have them publicly flogged. Maybe an uh, automated and, system, but whichever way, it's just useful to have it, that's all. There's an idea for a live stream, uh, uh, Oliver. We could we could have the, the guilty person responsible flogged live. No, that's probably against Facebook's terms of service, but we'll we think of a suitable punishment for them. Mm. I know who it is. <laughs> that's all we ask. <laughs> all right, guys, I will catch you. <laughs> Thanks for organising it, anyway, folks. Right? And we'll Thank see you. you all later. Take care, then. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.